Singapore's Department of Statistics reports that 6.6 .6 out of 1,000 married resident women and their partners split up in 2015. This divorce rate has nearly doubled since 1980, during which only 3.8 per thousand women were divorced. The number is higher for males, at 7.1 men per 1,000. We already know that marital conflict and divorce has negative repercussions on the mental and emotional well-being of all the parties involved, not only the couple and any children from the marriage, but in the context of Singapore, extended families as well. But what if methods or approaches can be put in place allowing for effective counselling when couples undergo marital conflict? As Singapore undergoes to develop its counselling agencies and promotes counselling as one of the ways to resolve marital conflict, finding out what makes marital counselling effective will become important not only to practising counsellors but also to government regulators. My name is Cheryl Chen and I will be exploring the answers to this question in my topic, Effective Approaches in Influencing Positive Outcomes When Counselling Singapore Couples Undergoing Marital Conflict. On slide one, I listed four main aspects of the counselling practice which can be adjusted as needed to produce positive outcomes for couples. These include organisation and logistics before counselling takes place, the counselling environment and setup, the mediums that are using counselling, as well as the counsellor's personal style and how they cater to the needs of clients. Let's move on to slide two. The approaches discussed on this slide are recommended on the premise that when it comes to solving marital issues, turning up for counselling is half the battle won. Clients cannot exactly benefit from effective counselling if they are not even motivated to attend. To this effect, Hicks and Hickman studied the behaviour of clients in terms of how likely they were to attend first appointments made after initial referrals to the counselling centre. Do counselling services that schedule appointments soon after referrals really do better in having clients that turn up for therapy? Hicks and Hickman's research shows that yes, when appointments were made within two weeks, clients were significantly more likely to attend counselling. If appointments were made between 4 to 12 weeks after the initial referrals, the incidence of clients attending counselling was reduced. The authors suggest that clients' impetus to seek help, which is very strong in the early stages of conflict between spouses, becomes weak if help is not promptly provided. After this early stage, clients are no longer motivated to attend counselling, but might start to see their problems as insurmountable. This ultimately leads to greater relationship issues down the line. To deal with long waiting lists, Hicks and Hicksman recommend offering reception interviews within two weeks of the initial referral. The counselling environment and its setup also influence the likelihood of couples coming to their scheduled sessions. In his pioneer 1973 study of 773 former marriage counselling clients treated by 21 counsellors, quickly investigated whether couples seen together or separately went on to have more sustainable marriages. His statistical results show that couples seen together, or conjoint therapy sessions these were called, were more likely to remain married and be happy in their marriages. Interestingly, the most common form of counselling at that time, where couples are interviewed separately or concurrent therapy, led to the worst outcomes. Hefner and Prokrashka conducted a follow-up study in 1984 on the effectiveness of concurrent versus conjoint sessions in marital counselling. Contrary to Kukuli's findings, Hefner and Prochaska's conclusions were that the two types of counselling had comparable outcomes. This corroborates with other research that shows that one legitimate form of psychotherapy rarely outperforms another. Should counsellors then pay attention to whether to have couples be counselled together or separately? The decision could be hinged on which type would encourage a particular client to continue with therapy. Cost-sensitive clients are likely to be dissuaded by twice the number of required sessions in concurrent as compared to conjoint counselling. Proposing conjoint sessions would thus encourage these couples to continue with counselling. Yet others might prefer concurrent sessions as these are easier to schedule and less stressful for clients where high levels of conflict exist between the couple. It is hence no coincidence that conjoint therapy suffers twice the dropout rate of concurrent therapy. In the next slide, I will discuss the various mediums that have been used in the counselling profession 
and how these can contribute to positive outcomes in couple therapy. The main advantage of counselling over the internet, as told by Gensius and Sedger, is that it allows counsellors to be available during non-office hours. Also, it allows counsellors access to clients who are not able to be physically present. Again, we see that, as in the previous slide's examples, attending counselling is the first and crucial step towards achieving good outcomes for conflicting couples. If being physically available is difficult due to distance or scheduling issues, conducting counselling with alternative mediums can be used in and of itself or as an interim measure between face-to-face -face sessions. These tools are particularly relevant in the context of Singapore, especially as the population becomes increasingly internet and media savvy. Residents of the city-state are also relatively mobile and for those who travel frequently, being able to continue with counselling through the internet at hours convenient to them, as well as by proxy, can be very helpful. In slide 4, I will talk about the various aspects of a counsellor's style and how these affect the effectiveness of a counselling session. Does the number of therapy sessions and each session's length affect how effective counselling is for couples? Mays believes so and discovers in his case study experiments that around five two-hour long sessions are sufficient to either improve marital conflict or to conclude that issues are irresolvable. The advantage of being able to quantify therapy time and associated costs appeals to Singapore's results-driven clients, who then become more likely to attend sessions. As mentioned earlier, counselling can only be effective if couples are motivated to attend. The next aspect for counsellors to consider is something that might surprise you. It was previously thought that therapy is successful when a patient acquires the attitudes and values of the counsellor. Bortler's investigations show, however, that when the attitudes of the two partners in a marriage converge in the process of counselling, whether or not the couple's attitudes agree with that of the counsellor, marital conflict is reduced. His research hence espouses the importance of finding ways during therapy to bring the attitudes and values of the couple closer together. There are also some intangible considerations for a counsellor. Ansa Hughes elaborates on these in her article with the premise that the basic characteristic of effective therapy is communication between a counsellor and client. She says that counsellors need to not only listen with their ears, but also with their eyes. On this basis, she develops four main ideas that a counsellor needs to keep in mind. Emphatic counselling. Emphatic understanding encompasses comprehending both the verbal and nonverbal responses of a client. In unconditional positive regard, the counsellor communicates that he or she likes the client, cares for them, and is not judgmental. Concreteness is the ability of a counsellor to be unambiguous and straight to the point about a client's behaviour and attitudes. And finally, establishing and maintaining rapport with the couple is fundamental and vital in order that they will share information such that successful counselling can occur. It is also important for a counsellor to be sensitive to the couple's culture and religion. This is particularly relevant in Singapore, as in the rest of Asia, as clients might not be as familiar with the practice of marital therapy or see attending as a stigma. Huang offers some useful tips here, including referring to therapy as education or training that would help couples develop emotional intelligence, people management, leadership skills, and the like. In terms of a client's religion or spirituality, Worthington suggests that religion can be helpful in strengthening a couple's moral commitment to their marriage. Through this agreement to be committed, he believes that marriage satisfaction is increased because a happy marriage then becomes viewed as a blessing instead of a right. We move on to the last and concluding slide. Over the last 60 years, counselling services in Singapore has developed steadily. As Singapore continues to develop its counselling agencies and to promote counselling as one of the ways to resolve marital conflict, understanding effective approaches that can influence positive outcomes for couples will benefit counsellors in their practice as well as the regulators who monitor counselling services. The effective approaches I have explored relate to pre-counselling, planning, the setup of a counselling service, mediums that can be used and counsellors' personal styles. It is hoped that with a better understanding of what works in marital counselling, conflicting couples can emerge from therapy with happier and more satisfying marriages and that all leads ultimately to lower divorce rates in Singapore. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Have a good day.